So let's bring in Hollywood divorce attorney David Glass for more on this. David, people going through divorces are going through some of the hardest times of their lives, and a lot of what they're going through is emotional. And in any divorce, there's a huge sense of loss and loss of relationship, of money, some friends. Hi, I'm David Glass, and welcome to the latest version of the Hourglass Podcast. Now in season five, we are featuring episodes that address the impact music has had on a person as they go through a breakup. And our guests today are Wadi Wachtel and Danny Korchmar, who star in the fantastic Hulu documentary, Immediate Family. Another of music historian Denny Tedesco's stories about the musicians who play in studio recording sessions and on tour with some of the most revered musical artists of our time. Both Danny and Wadi are not only two of the most sought after musicians by other musicians, they are also songwriters, performers, and producers in their own right. Both have worked with music chart toppers like Stevie Nicks, James Taylor, Phil Collins, Hall & Oates, David Crosby, Don Henley, Linda Ronstadt, Carol King, Keith Richards, and so many others. In fact, I could talk to them for an entire hourglass season about their work in the music industry. For instance, Wadi not only plays guitar, but also sings on many songs with Stevie Nicks and is currently on tour with her. Danny is given due credit for having been instrumental in shaping Don Henley's solo career. Today though, we're gonna narrow it down to a handful of questions about breakup songs they have written or performed and the inspiration behind how those songs came to be. So let's meet them. Introducing Wadi Wachtel and Danny Korchmar. Uh, so my first question for you guys is, what impact do you think music has on a person's psyche, particularly when they're going through a breakup? Uh, this is interesting to me because I'm a divorce lawyer and former psychologist. <laughs> from, from guys who perform and write and produce music, what do you guys have to say? Oh, man, you know, it's, it's different for everybody. You know, it really is. And whatever song is playing when you break up or when you fall in love or, you know, the song you grew, the songs you grew up with, that's what sticks in your mind and that's what influences you. So, uh, and it's different. And that experience is different from everybody. For some people, there's a Slayer tune that breaks their heart every time they hear it. That would, that would be true for me, but, uh, you know, so everybody's different, you know. That's all I can tell you about that. Yeah. yeah. It's also funny how the song that was you know quote unquote your song with someone it can instantly become the hated song of your life <laughs> you know <laughs> you know you love that song forever and then you never want to hear it again ever <laughs> right comes on the radio and you immediately change channels <laughs> so that stuff can get under your skin the point is that you know a song can get under your skin positive or negative you know Right. What uh, for you guys of the songs either you've written or performed on or just like listening to, uh, do you have a favorite uh, breakup song or a favorite sad song uh, that really brings out the emotions in you? Oh, boy. I don't know. Well, what? Well, <laughs> well, you know, uh, I wrote a song called Maybe I'm Right. Uh, and actually, it's it was about losing somebody it wasn't a breakup necessarily it was that we were just forced apart and uh it, it stuck with me a long time and uh i i that's that's always been a favorite and linda heard it and loved it and recorded it so that was really uh an amazing moment in my life for me right and so yeah. you wrote the song yeah 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 and and what would what were you going through in particular at the time that that caused you to write that song? I was going through a lot of heartache because uh, a girl that I was hoping to marry and I uh, got, we got separated by uh, a, uh, an outside force, let's say. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody interfered with our situation and uh, it caused us to be out of touch completely. And um, it kind of shattered everything I felt was going to happen. Yeah. And spent years and years wondering what was going to happen. In, the, in those first years when I moved to California, um, I wrote that song. And, and it, it's funny because I, when I started working for Linda, I had another a, a song that I'd written that was a love song. I felt when I moved to LA, I felt I saw Dolly Parton on TV, mm -hmm. and never saw anybody who looked like that. I was, you know, this is 1968, 
and fresh out of New York City, you didn't see any beehives and big titted women that were four feet tall. And she came out on stage and I'm going, look at this person, how, how weird. And as soon as she opened her mouth, I was hypnotized, as I have been since that first note I heard, and madly in love with her my entire life. And and I wrote a song about it. And when I started working for Linda, I played that, and they gave me songs. And I sat down with Peter and Linda and played them with song called Little Thing. And and after I played it, it was I was gonna, I was trying to decide. It was either play them, maybe I'm right, or Little Thing. We'd had such a good day in the studio, so I played the happy one. And Linda goes, at the end of it, she just looked at me. She goes, "Oh, I wish I felt that way about somebody." Yeah. <laughs> she goes, "Then I could sing that song, but I've never felt that way about anybody." Yeah. Wow. Oh, no, I picked the wrong song. Yeah, yeah. So it, it took months, months later, I finally got the opportunity to play Maybe I'm Right for her, and she loved it, and we, we did it. Uh, amazing, amazing story. How about how about you, Danny? Well, I'd say most of my songs are kind of cautionary tales or stories or stuff like that. I very rarely write love songs. But I have written a couple of songs recently that turned out to be the way I felt. I wrote a song with Stan Lynch. Um, and, uh, uh, at the time it wasn't true, but later when I fell in love with a woman, it turned out to be true. Yeah. And, uh, it's kind of <laughs> interesting how that happened, you know, uh, and it's called, I'm not made that way. And, and, um, it's a song about, you know, meaning it, being, standing up, being manning up and, and really being in love with somebody and staying with them. And, 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 um, at the time I was just uh, putting stuff together, ideas that I had. But then later, when I fell in love, it turned out to be absolutely true. And the song turned out to be about this person. So wow. I wrote the song before I met the woman that the song was about. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's great. You've, so you've each just shared with us a, a situation where you wrote a song. Uh, I'm sure you've written many, but that, that resulted from something emotional you went through. Does the writing the song or performing the song, is there any sort of cathartic effect? Does, does it make you feel better to get your feelings down on paper and into notes? Well, I don't, I'm not sure exactly about that. I know it makes me feel better to play music on any level. And to play, you know, just to play music enlightens you and lifts you up, you know. So it's hard to say, you know, one song does that. I'm not that, you know, the people that say, that's my song. I, I don't have, you know, that's my song. I have about a thousand, <laughs> that, that's my songs. You know? Yeah. So I think, it, I think it's more down to, for for people like us, it's getting to finish a song. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's that more than the emotional attachment. It's actually done. You know, there's a song that we did on our newest record that I wrote the melody for a long time ago, but I was never happy with the lyrics. And especially hanging out with my friend Danny, who's a brilliant lyricist. It, it put my mind into a more of a lyrical place, and I was able to finally complete the lyric to it. But that—that's the thing. It is—it's finished. You know, songs can take a long time to, to write themselves. Yeah, sure. that's true. Yeah, sometimes they come right away, but yeah. uh, not for me. They don't. You know, there's, I've, I've had tunes <laughs> hung around for. You know, sometimes I record a track and I go, oh, "I love this, and it's going to be great." You know, it's the right chords and everything, and then it sits around for two years because I don't know what to do with it. I don't just to, right. to sing over it. And I had a particular thing like that. And then finally, one day I wrote a lyric and just went right with it. And, and off we go. But it was two or three years later after I started the, the music of the thing. So it's hard to say. It's let me tell you, it's all different. And, it, and it's different for every story. Sure, sure. I've seen a lot of songwriters interviewed about that. Uh, from Billy Joel, who talks about writing the music first and figuring out the words later. And Bruce Springsteen who writes the lyrics in a notebook first and then figures out the music. Every every uh, Paul McCartney who says some you know songs came in a matter of minutes and others took years. So yeah. you can't tell. You know, Keith Richards has an expression that he uses. He goes, incoming, which means here comes an idea, a thought, you know. Wow. And I guess the idea is to grab that thought when it comes. Sure. And stay with it. Just the um just the process of songwriting is is fascinating to me. I've got a lawyer's mind, and so I can tell someone else's story in a way that's going to convince a judge. But creative writing, I, 
I've, I've tried, I've fooled around with it, and I just, I, I don't have the brain for it, maybe. Uh, but have you found that people either can be songwriters or can't, and it doesn't matter that you could take a course, you could go to college for it, either you have it or you don't? I don't think there's any way to learn songwriting. And the idea of going to a school or taking lessons to, le to learn songwriting is a, is a joke. Songs come to you. Some people can sit down like Diane Warren, gets up every day, goes to her piano and starts working. Waddy and I don't work like that. We can kind of wait for, like I said, incoming something, something to hit us yeah. and, uh, and set us off, you know. So it's a different kind of, it's, but it's different for everybody. It's different for every song. Yeah. It is. But you know, like Danny said, it's hard. It would be very hard to want to be a songwriter and go learn how to be a songwriter. Yeah. Right. It seems like that would be a, quite a challenge. Yeah. For, for, for both of you, uh, do you have a particular lyric that has stuck with you? Something you wrote in a, in a song and you just got it so right uh, that it, it could it could be an epitaph. It could be on your tombstone. It, it, it could be uh, on a plaque uh, forever. <laughs> Again, I think it's down to that, what I said about, it, it's more, I finished the song. Right. Rather than, oh, that line, you know, that's my best line ever. I want that on my tombstone. You know what I mean? It's, God damn it, I fucking finished that song finally. <laughs> I think, I mean, and like Danny said, sometimes they come quickly. Well, Danny said, maybe not for him, but but uh, a couple of times, songs will pop up and all of a sudden they'll just almost write themselves. That's right, yeah. And other songs will take years, months, years, hours, days. It doesn't, there's no, no set situation. Yep. It's an amazing, it's an amazing reality that everybody can all of a sudden get that idea popped in your head and and deal with it. And, and either you know how to deal with it at that moment, or you figure out how to deal with it later. But as long as you can capture it somehow, yeah, very important. Well, well maybe I've got for you, uh, Wadi. Your uh, Ronnie Dangerfield on his tombstone says, "There goes the neighborhood." Maybe yours is going to be, it's finally finished. You're talking about songs or your life, either way. I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah, for right. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a bad, that's not a bad uh, line, actually. Yeah. 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 Never know. Now, you two have worked together uh, as a team with, with other players, just the two of you, for a long time. It, it seems to me, uh, from my review of the, the movie, that you have a, a true partnership. Um, can, you, can you tell our audience... How long you've been working together and why you keep working with each other? I don't know. We've been playing together for 45 years or something. Yeah. You know, a long time. Yeah. So 45, yeah. 50 years. And uh, the reason why we can play together is because our styles are very different, but they go together real well. And uh, that just happened to be, and our personalities also go together real well. So we do very, for instance, he and I are working on, Wad and I are working on a session. It's not like we have long conversations about, well, you do this part and, and, and you, you do this part. A long conversation between the two of us would be, well, uh, you go high and I'll go low. Yeah. If, if that, that, that would be a long conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've just always wound up. It, it just seems automatic. Wherever Danny's left hand is going, my left hand is going to a different area of the neck. Right. And, and our, like Danny said, our styles are, are uniquely different, but our musical tastes and our musical loves are so similar. That's right. Yeah. From start to finish, we met over, uh, we we met over a reggae song, and we were both completely enamored and crazed about reggae. And the first song we got to play on together was a reggae tune, so we both instantly knew what to do on it. Right, and it was, it was amazing. And it went on from there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And have have the two of you ever argued? Well, when we you argue all the fucking time. Are you kidding? Yeah. You know, we scream at each other sometimes, you know. Over, but it's all over music. We're, we're, right. He and I are both very passionate about music and about it. lyrics, chord changes, how a song is structured. We're real passionate about it. And yeah, we'll yell at each other about it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, what I, we were, we were thick in an argument about the song Skin in the Game, actually. And we were yelling at each other, you know, really like, fuck you, yelling at each other, screaming, you're wrong, you're wrong. And, and I finally said, Danny, you know what's so great? This is how much we care about music. Right. So we're ready to 
ready to cut each other's throat over the opinion that we both hold. That's right. That's what that's the most beautiful part of a passionate relationship. It's how deeply we care about the music. We're ready to kill each other over it. <laughs> right. It's yeah, very that's serious. It. Very serious. Yeah. And still and still come back the next day and continue working with each other though. I mean, we love each I'm other. It's, it's not that we love each other. It's not that, but yeah. like he said, we're very passionate about the music. I hear something a certain way and I'm furious. I don't get that he doesn't hear it exactly right, the same right, way. Right. What's wrong with you? You know? And that's that's what it was. I was saying I just thought I don't get this. And he can go, What do you mean you don't get it? <laughs> and I'm going, it shouldn't start like that. It should start like this. And goes, no, man, no. It, and it was fantastic. And but a minute later, we're, you know, what what's that fast is we're back to everything where we, you know, everything's fine. Right, right. You gotta remember we're both from New York, so you know, yeah. we don't hold back and, and we're both used to yelling and screaming, so <laughs> <laughs> big deal. Yeah, I'll tell you what, my uh, my both of my parents' families grew up in, in Brighton Beach, uh, New York. Uh, and we used to, and I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, a totally different experience. And we would go into Brooklyn for major holidays. And I always came home with a stomach ache. And uh, it was because all of their relatives were, were so passionate and yelling at each other, and, but, but loved each other. And it took me a long time to understand what was going on in Brighton Beach. Right. Right. Well, that's the way everybody talks to each other in Brighton Beach. Yeah. That's very funny. <laughs> Now there are there are five of you who have been a tight knit family for decades, uh, now known as the immediate family. How have the five of you managed to stick together uh, and working together when all sorts of other groups fail? Well, for one thing, actually, you, you go ahead, Juan. Well, I was going to say it's actually the four of us have been together for. Okay. With Danny, Lee, and Russell, especially, have been together. I would say a solid fifty years, and I came along three or four years later. And then okay. the four of us have been together since then. Steve Postel, as we say, he's the new guy. We've right. only known him about 20 years. Right. You know? So he's still got some green on him. But right. the four of us have been in the trenches together forever. Yep. So uh, how does how does that work? It's, you know, I I've read various documentaries about bands that break up and Van Halen breaking up and with David Lee Roth versus Sammy Hagar, et cetera. What, what has kept the four of you at least and, and at some points five together? Well, those are different bands. Those are bands they do nothing but, but you know, yeah. play with each other and, and tour with each other continuously. The fact that they, don't need, that they can even stand each other after a tour <laughs> is, 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 is unique. And Watt and I, you know, we work with a lot of different people, a lot of different people, sometimes mm -hmm. together, sometimes separately. But uh, because of that, it's not like, you know, we, we uh, think of it as, as, a, uh, as something where it's just, just the band. In other words, yeah. we do a lot of different stuff and, and, it, and it all mm -hmm. brings, it all comes together in the band. Right. Well, the four of us have been together that long, but we haven't been a band for 45 years. Right. We've been working in and out of other people's lives together or some of us together. Sometimes it'll be just the two of us on a session. Or sometimes it'll just be Leland and Russell and myself or just Lee and me, me Danny and Russ. All these number of combinations, but that's what we've been in our lives, in each other's lives that long. Doing that, we haven't been a band. I don't know if we'd still be alive. We would, forty-five years later, have having you know, having having been a band that long. Yeah, right. That would have been a lot of arguments. But yeah. This way, we we've, we've always it's so it's always a joy when we get together, as it is now when we play together, because we finally get to do our own music, and and after all these years of doing it for other people. That's such an honor and a joy for us. It's uh, so we don't. Our, our sessions are beautiful in the, in the studio. But Danny and I will argue, but anyone else, <laughs> they just they just know we're going to find it, and they're they're very patient with us. And and there isn't that much talk when we go in the studio. Hmm. It's the, the speakers do all the talking. You yeah. play something, we listen back, and it, it, we've been doing this our whole lives. So you know right away when you hear it back, okay, that's wrong. The thing that you thought was going to be so perfectly right is completely wrong. 
And as soon as you hear it back, you realize that. Yeah. You change it. Okay. Have either of you ever been involved with either playing on sessions or playing with a, a group on tour where just it, it wasn't right? It was uh, things were not set up right. It wasn't feeling right. And how did you how did you move on from those bad feelings? <laughs> well, you know, when you start off, everything's wrong. You know, yeah. <laughs> everything is right. You're playing with, with cheap gear that breaks. You're, you know, the transportation is horrible. There's six of you in a station wagon plus all the gear. So when you start off, it's horrible. If you start, you know, doing doing better, as you start doing better, things become easier. And, and uh, yeah. and you know, the, a weight gets lifted off of you. But it's a lot easier to do it when you're doing well, when you're making money, than it is when you're starving. Yeah. Sure. And, and, and it's why in the studio, you can wind up on a session where it's just going wrong, you know, I mean, and, and there's nothing you can do about it except be thankful you got the job. I mean, that's our, one of our main goals, it was like Russell put it in the movie, it's beautiful. Uh, I just try not to get fired, you know. When you're, really when, you're on, when you're a studio musician, you're on call, if your phone isn't ringing, you're not working. Right. And, uh, that's the key. I, and I, it's funny, I asked a friend of mine as a plastic surgeon, I said, you know, in my business, if that phone is dead, I'm dead. How is it for you? He goes, it's exactly the same for me. Are you kidding me? If I don't have patience, what am I doing? I'm doing nothing. You know, right. so it's all down to that. But you can walk into a session, and the session seems like it's going to be a great day. And then all of a sudden, the song, you don't like the song, or... The producer doesn't know what he's doing, or the engineer is screwing up, or machines are breaking down. <laughs> you know, all kinds of technical things that can go wrong and will go wrong. But like I said, as, as long as you're not fired, we can get out of there and get paid for having done a good job that, and hope to find the ring the next day. You know, there's things that happen in the studio. You can go in and everything's fine one day. And then you go in the next day, nothing, nothing's changed. The amp right. settings are the same. The mic placement is the same. And it stinks. And, then, and it, why? You don't know why. It's just yeah. everything is terrible. And there's not, nothing you do makes it better. I've been on a few, fortunately, very few sessions like that. But it's happened. It's you know? true, yeah. Nothing's and, changed. Right. And you keep looking around, what? What's <laughs> going on? Why is, it, why is it not happening? And it's killing you because uh, when things aren't right, it's terrible. Not, you know, to, to be in a studio working on music that, where you want it to be great and it's not, that's really a terrible feeling, you yeah. know. And it, the water now do anything to make something happen in this studio, something good happen. Right. So it's over there. Sounds like from the both of you, whether you're talking about early career to when you start making money or bad sessions, it's, it's perseverance. It's knowing that while one day is bad, the next day could be better or should be better. Or the other yeah. way around. <laughs> but the other way around, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, as a divorce lawyer, every day when I come out of court on trial, at the end of a trial, after making closing argument, I say to myself silently in my head when I hit the hallway, on to the next disaster. It, the, 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 next, the next case is coming along, the next person's tragic story is coming along, and I've got to leave this one in the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's not as serious, quite as serious as that with us, you know, but... Uh, you know, well, things go right, things go wrong. People disappear, then they return. You know, it's it's uh, it's 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 life. You know, we don't get paid like divorce lawyers, though. I've been noticing. <laughs> well, let me ask you: Did you at any point in either of your lives, early lives, did you dream of being something other than uh, uh, musicians, uh, Never. producers, songwriters, session musicians, tour musicians? That's all the same thing. Okay. Yeah. So, it was, no. but never dreamed of anything else. I didn't, and neither did Watt. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was always music, right? From a very young age, it was. I, 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 I walked around singing songs all the time, wondering why everyone else wasn't singing them, why you know people don't know that song. Or I heard my brother couldn't sing. You know, and my brother started singing one day. Went, geez, you can't sing. You know, like, how come you? How come I can and you can't? And but I was always addicted to, to songs on the radio. Before I played guitar, I was humming tunes, learning tunes. It was just always there. Mm -hmm. 
Hey. Where can people find out more information uh, about you? The, uh, the immediate family documentary is, is on Hulu, but if they want to know what you're performing on or, or what you're going to be touring on, where can they find information? Oh, it all comes up. You know, uh, uh, everything we do eventually gets uh, uh, publicized and, and put out there, you know. And, and, you know, all, all, the streaming, all the streaming services for sure. Mediafamilyband.com, I think, is the, is the site. And, uh, but it's on Facebook, Instagram, everywhere, Twitter. Right. Well, that's great. It, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to two musicians, all around musicians of your caliber, and hearing some of the uh, the backstories. Okay, our pleasure. And I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Certainly, thanks, thanks for yeah, thanks for Thank talking you. to us. Thanks so much, thanks guys. Much, David, take care. Thank yeah. you.